Gentlemen, my name is Tim Tates, and I am the Director of Outreach for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. It gives me great pleasure to be here today with you, and on behalf of our organization, welcome you to our event here to honor the National Vietnam War Veterans Day. I'd like to begin by thanking all of the Vietnam veterans in our midst for their service, for their sacrifice, and for what they continue to give to our nation today. This holiday was created in 2012 and enacted into law in 2017. And it gives us that opportunity to recognize for those of us who served after Vietnam and all who served and who are citizens of the United States, the great debt of gratitude that we have this generation that is known as the Vietnam Veterans. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund has the wonderful honor to host this ceremony up here on the knoll overlooking the Vietnam Memorial, but we don't take that lightly. In fact, we look out to the community and try to find the best partners that we can to help put that on each year. In the last year, we had our traveling replica wall, the wall that heals in Upper Providence Township. And our hosts in Upper Providence Township began months in advance in preparing for that. And by the time they were done, they proved to us that they were one of the most incredible hosts that we've had in years. But one of the things that they pulled off that had never been done, that really stuck in our minds and hearts was the fact that they took time to do a service, a service just for those veterans who have come back and passed away, our in memory honorable members. And that was very special as they turned the wall orange. And that's really what earned them the opportunity today. So I'd like to welcome our wonderful committee and members and citizens of Upper Providence Township and that nearby vicinity to the podium today to begin our ceremony. Their MC is a OIF, OEF veteran, a member of the Upper Providence Township Police Department, George Pelletier. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome all the Vietnam veterans who are here today for Vietnam Veterans Memorial Day. I would also like to honor the 58,281 service members whose names are on the wall right behind me. I'm George Pelletier from the Upper Providence Township Police Department in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. I served in the Army from 2002 to 2014 as a military police staff sergeant. My family has a history of service from my father, uncles, and grandparents. I served in combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and enjoyed my time in the military. For those of you who deployed, maybe you'll have a, a story similar to mine. Whenever my unit, the 367th Military Police Company, deployed, we were always greeted by Vietnam veterans at the airports and in the USO. I remember one time having a conversation with a Vietnam veteran who told me that when he came home, he was spat on at the airport and called many horrible names. He told me that he could not let that ever happen again. I could not believe that would happen back home on U.S. soil. So I began to look further into the treatment of our Vietnam veterans, and I did not like what I discovered. Many times these veterans were there to send us off, and they were the first ones to welcome us back. And they always told us how they were treated and that they would never let that happen again. In the beginning of 2023, Upper Providence started a planning committee for bringing the wall that heals to our township. Police Chief Mark Freeman asked me if I would like to be involved, and of course, I answered yes. In late October of 2023, we hosted the Wall That Heals. The first time I saw the wall was later that night after it arrived. It was so powerful and emotional seeing the display and all the veterans looking around it, and it brought tears to my eyes. After the wall left Upper Providence, we didn't expect to hear from the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund so soon. Our committee was invited here to Washington, D.C. to put on a presentation. I was completely blown away by this invitation. What struck me even harder is that this is the first time a host city of the wall that heals has been invited to Washington for this amazing honor. Tim, I hope we uh, meet your expectations and set a new bar for this going forward. 
Vietnam veterans are like in a class with no many of them. Many volunteered and an estimated 1.9 million were drafted. I cannot imagine what that was like going through the draft lottery and getting selected. Knowing what was going on from all the live TV broadcasts and press coverage at that time. These were all very brave men and women. I personally, from the bottom of my heart, want to say thank you to all who have served and welcome home. I'd like to begin our program with introducing Pastor Sam Alstock from, from Valley Forge Baptist Temple. Thank you, Officer Pelletier, for the invitation to participate in this honorable ceremony. Having grown up here in the Washington, D.C. area, I visited these memorials many times as, throughout my childhood. And now that I'm a grandfather, I want my grandchildren to see these same monuments, to learn the lessons that they teach, and to appreciate the sacrifices that Americans have made and that are memorialized here in stone. Every monument tells a story. And on this Vietnam Veterans Wall, there are over 58,000 stories of courage and sacrifice that need to be told and retold at the dinner tables across this great land. By your attendance here today, I see that you care about our past and that you care about our future. One example of healing that came after the Vietnam War comes from a lady by the name of Kim Phuc. As a nine-year-old, Kim became known as the Napalm Girl, and we have all seen the iconic photograph of her running down the street with siblings, terror on their faces as they escaped a firebomb from a Vietnamese Sky Raider. She was not expected to survive her injuries, but she did, and her life was filled with bitterness and hatred until the age of 19 when she wandered into a library and she picked up a book that we call the Bible. And in the pages of that book, she discovered God's forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. She spoke at our church five years ago and she said the following, quote, after I was forgiven, I learned to forgive and my heart was healed. And now she's a UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador, and she helps other child victims of war. Our church in Valley Forge is privileged to assist her son, Thomas Bowie, who he and his family have dedicated themselves as missionaries to take the Bible's message of hope and redemption back to Southeast Asia. And like Kim, we all need God's help especially during times of trial. Would you join with me? And we're gonna have a word of prayer for God's comfort for the families that were so impacted by the war that we are addressing this morning. Let's pray together. Dear Father of mercy, we bow to ask you to accept our humble and hearty thanks for your blessings and protection. We are here to reflect on the sacrifice the full measure of devotion that our fellow countrymen and women made in their military service to the American people. We are recipients of the freedom that they helped to preserve for the families of Americans that st still feel the loss of loved ones who did not come home from Vietnam and other wars. We ask you, gracious Father, in their behalf for their comfort and peace and for your unending supply of grace to face the challenges that confront them. Would you direct our thoughts unto yourself that we may live in reverential awe of you, that we may labor to serve our fellow man and ever run in the ways of thy commandments. And may we be watchful to preserve the truth that you have. As our nation faces challenging trials, guide our president and his administration who need true wisdom that comes from you. 
when our nation errs, correct us. When we do good, bless us. When we are weak, give us men and women of faith and courage and sacrifice and godliness to guide this blessed nation. And when our lives are done and we stand before you to give a final accounting of how we lived here, may we be found to have lived in the way that your son taught us in the scriptures. Bless our speakers to come and, and focus our attention on the lessons and sacrifices that bring us to this solemn occasion. And we humbly pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as we honor America. I ask all veterans and those in uniform to render the hand salute for the national anthem. And those of you not in uniform, please place your hand or your hat over your heart. Please welcome for the Pledge of Allegiance from the DC chapter, um, Beth Hicks. of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Performing the National Anthem is Master Gunnery Sergeant Kevin Benier of the President's Own United States Marine Corps Band. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you, Mr. Gunnery Sergeant. I'd like to present the first of our three speakers this evening. Communication Specialist, Specialist 4, John Pearson. I'd thank everybody for coming. I'd like to tell you a story. A story about a friend of mine, Dennis McGuire. This is not a blood and guts war story. Or is it about some heroic Medal of Honor feat? It's just a story about a friend of mine. Dennis and I grew up in a small town of less than 1,500 people where everybody knew your name and your business. We went to school together at St. Gertrude's Catholic School in West Conshohocken. As I said, small town. Everybody knew your business. So if you did anything wrong in our neighborhood, your mother knew about it within hours. If she didn't get the news right away, she got it after church on Sunday when speaking to the other mothers. Trust me, 
We didn't get away with much without getting a belt across our ass. Dennis and I lived a few blocks from each other and would often walk to school together. I'd stop in and say hi to Mrs. McGuire and watch her get the rest of the brood ready for school as Dennis and I slipped out the side door to get a head start on everyone else. Back in those days, you walked to school even if it snowed, but that was always a good reason for being a little late for class, even though it was really the snowball fights that made us late or the bombarding of the traffic on the street and the mean looks from the drivers who pummeled their cars with snowballs. It was a great neighborhood where most of your friends were only a quick shout away, and that's how we communicated. A quick woo would bring the gang together. On one occasion, we decided to play a game of bring up, a sort of hide and seek game with a twist. We decided to play this game in an old barn across the street from McGuire's house, down the street from Michelle's where there were four brothers. We played the game for hours. Then while hiding in one of the horse stalls, Dennis picks up this gooey brown, these gooey brown things from the stable floor, starts flinging them at everyone as they ran by. Well, the next thing you know, everyone is throwing these gooey brown things at each other. As kids, little did we know, I guess, or care, we were throwing horse shit at each other. <laughs> Needless to say, that night, the Mother's Network was a blaze of horse smelly children. The McGuire house was always a great place to hang out. Their backyard backed up to a creek, and behind that was a field and then Gleba's junkyard. The junkyard was always a fun place to play hide and seek and sit in old rusty tired cars and pretend you were racing down Ford Street, the main street in our town. We often played cowboys and Indians and army with wooden sticks as guns and we loved playing with our little plastic army guys. You can still find them in dollar stores today. Once Dennis and I were playing with these little green plastic guys down by the creek and his brother Michael came down to join in the fun, he wanted to make it a little more realistic. So he ran into the house and brought out some lighter fluid and lit things up. He dripped some of the melting plastic army guys down on the scene we made and made it look like bombs were dropping. Lucky for us, the Mother's Network never found out. One time we were in third or fourth grade and the nuns would make us slide the desks together to fit everyone into the small classrooms we had. There were four large rooms and each room had two grades. So one year you're learning third grade material and the next you're learning fourth grade material. One day, Dennis and I are sitting next to each other, and he says to me, look what I found on the way to school today. I looked down at his hand, and he must have had a hole in his pocket. And I'm sure you can guess what he pulled out through that hole. <laughs> Lucky for him, the nuns didn't see, but it wouldn't have been the first time we were put in front of the class for Sister Michael Marine's knuckle-busting ruler. Life was pretty idyllic growing up in a small town. We graduated from St. Gertrude's, moved on to Upper Marion High School, and even though we found many new friends, we remained close. During high school years, I can remember watching Walter Cronkite give the news coming out of Vietnam. He gave the daily casualty list for both sides of the war, and it seemed like we were winning with fewer dead and wounded. Dennis and I graduated with our class in June of 1967, and I lost touch with him for several months. And then I heard from one of our friends that he had enlisted in the, in the Army. Less than a year after graduation, Dennis was in Vietnam. His brother Michael was already there, and I wondered, why would he do this? Why would he put himself in harm's way? On December 20th, 1968, my friend Dennis died. He was only 19 years old. He was a casualty of an unpopular war. Over 33,000 soldiers on this wall of 58,000 plus boys were 19 years old or younger. And I said boys because that's what we fought this war with, boys. Word got out when his funeral was going to be, 
and all his friends and family were there. The military sent their honor guard and even sent his brother Michael home for his funeral. He had a military funeral. I have absolutely no idea how Mr. and Mrs. McGuire were dealing with his death. I had attended grandparents' funerals, so I was familiar with death, but never had I lost a friend at such a young age. And this was unreal, unimaginable, unthinkable. It tore me up inside and I looked at it different and I looked at life differently from that point on. As we all met at the gravesite to put my friend to rest, everyone had tears rolling down their cheeks. We were all hugging each other for comfort and support, but the worst was yet to come. Off in a distance was a lone bugler playing taps. And as I write this, I cannot help but cry. And For, and for the, again, for the loss of my friend. At 74 years old, I've been to many funerals, and more than 50 years later, just the thought of that day still brings tears to my eyes. Two months, two months later, February 3rd, 1969, I enlisted in the Army, or should I say the Army gave me a choice, either enlist or we'll draft you the next time. So I thought if I might die over there, at least I want people to know that I chose to fight. Seven months after Dennis passed, I was in Vietnam. When I came home from Vietnam, I was different. I wasn't that happy-go-lucky, carefree individual that I was before. I used to dream about things that I witnessed, but over the years you forget and the dreams fade, but I never stopped thinking about my friend Dennis. Several years ago, I started having dreams about him. They'd wake me in the middle of the night. One dream was so vivid, I thought I was actually talking to him. I woke up crying because I was upset with myself. My better half was shaking me, asking if I was okay. I told her I was upset because I asked him where he was. I didn't think to ask him how he was. I couldn't tell if this was a dream or reality. I started going to bed with hopes of dreaming like that again so I could apologize to him for not being so thought un so, so thoughtful. About two years ago, a Marine friend of mine, Bill Bizazaro, told me about the wall that heals. So I looked it up on the internet and decided that this would be a great way to honor my friend and all those lost in that crazy war. My reason for you telling these personal things about my friend is that everyone on that wall has stories like these. So when you touch that wall to remember those personal things about your friends, try not to think of all the things they've missed over these past 50 years. Cherish their personal moments you had with them. To those of us who survived the war and to those families who lost loved ones, I still see their faces and we still feel their pain and we will until our own passing because they were our friends, husbands, wives, sons, and daughters. God bless the warriors on that wall. Thank you for letting me tell you the story about my friend Dennis. And if you have time, stop by panel West 36, line 53 and say hi to my friend. Thank you. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is no stranger to the disabled American veterans community. He served from 1968 to 1974 as a recipient of multiple Purple Hearts. Please welcome Infantry Staff Sergeant Rich Custer. What an honor to be here and to have been invited by the Veterans Fund. My name is Rich Custer. I served in the U.S. Army from 1968 to the final 1974, being my last day there. After graduating, uh, 
junior college, I received an invite from uh, Uncle Sam to see the world. Like many other boys and girls of my time, that was probably an offer that I couldn't turn down. I was fortunate to, shore, to share the first leg of my service with a very close friend who stood in line next to me as we took our oaths into the U.S. Army. There are many stories like this, but during our basic training at Fort Bragg, we received a letter from home saying that another friend, somebody that we had looked up to our entire lives and grew up with, had been killed in Vietnam. For Den and me, this added a whole new experience to our military service. Robert Morris Childress is on panel 50 West, Road 12. After basic training, they went to advanced infantry training, as a lot of the people had the uh, infantry MOS. Following my uh, advanced infantry training, I went to uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, I was uh, fortunate and honored to become part of the 31st Infantry attached to the 9th Division, which is a 103-year-old infantry regiment. They're known as America's Foreign Legion because of the amount of time that they, they served abroad. Um, they have over 12 deployments since 9-11 and are currently attached to the 10th Mountain Division Fort Drum. They're just an amazing fighting group. What an honor for me to be part of that. While in Vietnam, I witnessed good friends becoming casualties of battle and others that gave the ultimate sacrifice. Of course, their names appear in the law. Many soldiers don't speak or put high self-praise in their accomplishments or awards. Their thoughts are with those that fought by their side, and especially those who gave their life. I'm no exception. I am humbled by their sacrifice, and I carry in my wallet for the last 50 some years the names of those who fought beside me. Their location on the wall and their memory is forever burned in my mind. After my military service, I was uh, uh, spent 38 years in, in uh, the corporate side. And now I enjoy the satisfaction of working with veterans, those that I respect so much. Um, George Benson, um, Commander of the Chapter Chapter 25, Disabled American Veterans, Senior Vice Committee Man, District 13, Department of Pennsylvania, DAV. I'm Vice Commander, also a military order for our junior Vice Commander, the Blackbird Track Chapter, and a member of of Trap VFW 7155, who members stand behind me. Also proud to be a founding member of the U.S. Army Museum. I am also an active member of very fortunate in our community to have a military museum of the Spring Corn Historical Society. It's fitting I stand here next to Memorial that I ask this question, are there any Gold Star family members here? Thank you for your sacrifice. And for those listening, God will, will bestow a special blessing on you for the great sacrifice you have been asked to endure. Your loved one's passing will not be in vain. Freedom still reigns, and the fight continues in the hearts of minds that cherish it. I know this wall has heart-rendering meaning for you, and I thank you. I have to admit that I mentioned this before, I'm, I'm really humbled to be here at the National Memorial. I remain in all the five million visitors that come here each year. They continue to build a legacy for the 2.7 million service members that served in Vietnam. And of course, for the 58,000 plus that did not return. There's been many speeches from this hallowed place with words that defined our gratitude for those giving the ultimate sacrifice behind me. This special day, March 29th, is meant to pay tribute to the veterans of the Vietnam War, including the military who are presidents of war 
who are listed missing in action. On this day, the bar is raised at whatever is said and done in front of this wall. And we do appreciate the day and the recognition. For me, it took almost 40 years to face one of the most challenging, life-changing times. Separate to most survivors of this war, a burden of guilt is carried that your name does not appear on this wall. And why were you allowed to come home? I know there is a name for this. It's called survivor's guilt. The young boys, mostly in their teenage years, just answering a call from their country to serve. Many went as they followed footsteps of their father, their grandfather, their brother, their cousin, their uncle, or their friend, not fully understanding the meaning of service. After all, we were young. What we understand now is that we carried the hope to bring the opportunity of freedom to a part of the world living in fear, just like our deployed soldiers men and women today. Today, through my words, I challenge each and every one of you to consider there are more than just names on this wall. John mentioned about the stories. Yes, their stories are attached to the name. We can step toward that polished granite, reach out, touch, and trace a name. For many, this simple act produces a flood of emotions that only they understand. They stand there in silence, some with watery eyes. Sometimes they may leave a physical memory behind of their loved ones or comrade at the base of the wall. And it believes, it is believed that this has helped with closure. So the, tour, the stories are told in silence with the teddy bears, the letters, the dog tags, the hats, the pictures in the walkway of the wall at the end of the day. So this marks the first clue that the name must convey more than just letters we trace on the wall. Just for one moment, I would like to provide some context to the names of the soldiers whose lives were cut abruptly by the sword of battle. This could be seen possibly as moments before or moments after. And I'm sure it, I'm sure it applies to more than a few names on a wall. I want to talk about the soldier's friend, a battle buddy, somebody that can tell that story. They're actually called a battle buddy and their story is one that they'll never forget. They vividly recall the last words, the last look, and the last moment of a soldier who strapped his helmet on and boarded the long line of helicopters in a fire base rice paddy somewhere in South Vietnam or North Vietnam. They quickly lifted off, cleared the jungle canopy, and young men who just endured weeks of training now were 10,000 miles from the neighborhood where they spent most of their life. For many of them, this is the first time they were even 10 miles from home and the place that they grew up. Being in country for more, even a short period of time, those boys' faces are replaced with hollowed jaws, bloodshot eyes, uniforms coated with sweat and dirt. This produces a clear picture of a warfighter. Each day as they anticipated the consequences of moving in the wrong direction or losing their focus just for one minute for fear it might be their last. Well, this particular mission was a single raid against an enemy stronghold just a few miles into the jungle joined by some Arvin troops, and Arvin troops were the Republic of Vietnam's own army that often fought with U.S. troops. And they sought to liberate a small village that had been infiltrated by the Viet Cong, Viet Cong, commonly referred to as our enemy. 
as the helicopter has hovered over the water-soaked mud in the rice paddy to land, the soldiers maneuvered their equipment-weighted body close to the door. Their equipment adding as much as 40 pounds, in some cases, to a very diminutive body. Still 20 feet from ground, they bounced themselves on the skid, and at the right time, they pushed off. The rotor stirred up mud and water, smashing against their face like pieces of stone. Their obstructed view by the muck in their eyes, they moved through the open field to find the safety of a berm. A berm is something that cuts through most rice fields down south, but provide walking paths away from the three or four water-soaked paddies that contain water on the ground. This in an open field provides the only place that they can go for some safety. As they laid there waiting for the command to move out, water began seeping through their boots. They had a brief thought. Maybe this wasn't so bad. After all, we're going to begin a three-day stand down and they'd be back at base camp by nightfall. Maybe grabbing a few hours of sleep some dry fatigues. Just then, as he lay there, he sees the water and the dirt kick up on the berm. Someone yells, sniper in the trees. Instinctively, he raised his rifle, but before it meets his shoulder, his world goes dim. For this soldier, like many other soldiers on the wall behind me, Destiny had another plan. In the darkness of battle, a sniper found its target, and without warning, his soul found a permanent home. A scream for a medic, call from his buddy, but there's nothing he can do. A medic fact is called, the landing zone is secured, and he is carried to the chopper. His buddies do what they can to deal with the grief, knowing this flood of emotions has no place in battle. They needed to keep themselves in the same fate. So as the chopper carried off their friend, they continued to fight. We are forced to remembering the last moments as they jumped onto the choppers, followed by the horror of seeing them laying there, lifeless on the ground, after a fire, fire flight, a booby trap, explosion, or an ambush. Reality hits when we return to base and stare at their empty cot with pictures of their wife, girlfriend, or even kids stapled to the wall above their cot. Try to remember the last word of the discussion they had the night or the morning before, but we constantly lean on these memories because it fills the emptiness of their loss. So many just see a name that are not aware of the last mention or their last thought. The family tree will lose to the branch and another panel on the wall is filled. The 58,282 American patriots, names that are etched in stone, become static with the war's end. But our life goes on. As you look at the wall, I ask you to think about young women and men memories that have been preserved through some of the most brutal conditions ever faced by Americans in war. The suffocating heat, the drenching monsoon rains, an enemy that could come out of nowhere and disappear just as quickly. The nights at times seem endless. The insects, the animals, the movement in the brush. Heighten your senses. In the dark you are aware of every minute at times he felt the clock was frozen. I remember the phrase, the silence is deafening. When it all got quiet, you got upset. You knew that something had disturbed the normal surroundings. In the darkness, your ears and your eyes were your best allies. Sometimes you just created a numbness of senses. This would, at some point, pacify the fear. There would, be relief, there would be relief in the daylight, but it never seems to come. 
manage your fear and the anticipation of certainty had to become acquired skill for those men and women as well as the, all their survivors. For us in the Condela, it was a jungle. For others, there were some of the most tense, intense urban combat in history. The battles up north for a single hill that could rage for weeks. And of course, the inhumane conditions and mistreatment of soldiers at the infamous Hanoi Hill. As a nation, we celebrated our historic victories in Europe during European continent during World War II. Let us also speak of the Vietnam War fighters at Hue, Khe San, Han Sanuk, Saigon, Tet, Hamburger Hero, Rolling Thunder. All too often, it's forgotten that our troops in the Vietnam won every battle they fought in. Do not believe the statement, they lost the war. We as a country just discontinued to fight. The battle buddies that I talked about earlier to names on the wall came home to a confused population, as George mentioned. One what that was unable to sort out the difference between the fighter and the war. For us, young soldiers, this became difficult to process. We just wanted to be back in the neighborhood again, pick up where we left off. When you came home, I know many of you put your medals away, put your fatigues in the door or in a box, and you went on with your lives. You started families, you pursued careers. A lot of you didn't talk too much about your service. As a consequence, this nation has not always appreciated the chapter of your lives that came before. There was an inscription that um, I found on a lighter they sold in the PX back in 1968-69. It said, we the unwilling, trained by the unskilled to do the impossible or the ungrateful, that is 10 minutes too late. For those that were drafted, it at times rang true. I can tell you that the Vietnam veterans that I know are like a phoenix rising from the ashes. They build up organizations like the DAV, the DFW, Military Order for the Heart, the American Legion, the Vietnam Veterans of America, to remind and sometimes push the government to make good on their responsibilities to help those men and women who gave so much to keep the American tradition alive for future generations. We didn't just take care of ourselves, we cared for those that followed and paid forward our reverence. We made it our mission to make sure that today's troops get the respect and support that is all too often we didn't receive. I heard it said that a soldier is someone who, at one point in his life, wrote a blank check, a blank check payable to the United States of America for the amount up to and including their life. God bless these souls on the wall who never came home and those that protect us today. We have a special corner in our hearts and our memory for those that stood beside us on the battlefield. We commit to never forgetting those who gave less full measure of devotion to achieve lasting peace. I assure you, they want peace. Soldiers want peace. Each one of us, I believe, harbors an unwritten charter to be the voice for those that can no longer speak, whose names are on this wall, surrounding ourselves with thoughts and the best time filters out the pain and the futility of not being able to shake their hand, listen to their hope stories of their home so far away. War speaks with a finality that for a young soldier is hard to comprehend. The events I just told you were a glimpse and a piece of the American story. The depth of sacrifice extends well beyond the soldier's name. 
So on this wall, it falls to every generation to bring value to their sacrifice. Memorials like the one behind me exist to immortalize the ultimate portraiture of their future that our men and women made in, in flight against any political ideology that destroys human free will. So here today, as these names are forever etched in granite and those surviving, it must be said, Vietnam veterans, you have earned your place among the greatest generation. Hopefully, whoever reads these names will understand the seriousness of war and gain a new respect for those who die for the country. I know we all took our oath seriously. The oath, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The debt that we owe their sacrifice can never be repaid. There's a relevant message that I heard given in a speech by Ronald Reagan on Memorial Day some years ago. And it goes like this. If words cannot repay the debt we owe these men, surely our actions, we must strive to keep pace with them and with the vision that led them to battle and to their final sacrifice. As veterans, we despise forever war. As pioneers of freedom, we're held the world stage as protectors and preservationists. It's in our DNA to champion individualism. While we keep sacred free thought, we hope we're not alone in battling the constant physical and moral assault, uh, assault of our God-given rights. War fighters during Vietnam face the judgment of moralists by being defined as baby killers. However, patriots today understand their lifetime of sacrifice. And that in itself taught me to champion self-determination and the liberties it brings. The question is always asked, and I will answer, yes, I would serve again. At this time, Although Vietnam veterans who are not standing, please stand. All those that cannot stand, please raise your hand. As we say these simple words that always greet their troops when they come home. Welcome home. So hopefully with my words today, you leave here remembered the inscriptions on the wall do not contain names. They demand a solid contemplation of freedom. The letters in their name render a lesson in courage, service, sacrifice, devotion to duty, and country that bring honor to all who know them. For those that have served or experienced combat, we're named a hero. Uh, I, for one, feel I'm not worthy of that measurement. What we see behind us on this wall are men and women whose greatness cannot be measured in values. It's not a quarter measure, it's not a half measure, it's a full measure of their ultimate sacrifice. They can be defined as heroes. I'll leave you with a passage that I heard last week from the Bible. Ecclesiastics 44, 1 15. Some of them have left behind a name, so others declare their praise. But others, there's no memory. They have perished as though they had never existed. They have become as though they had never been, they and their children after them. But these were also godly men whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten. Their wealth will remain with their descendants and their inheritance with their children's children. Their descendants stand by the covenant, their children also for that sake. Their offspring will continue forever and their glory will never be blotted out. The bodies are buried in peace, but their name lives on generation to generation. I'd like to thank the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. 
since the dedication of the wall, they have pursued a mission of preserving legacy of the wall, promoting healing, and educating all who listen. The impact of the Vietnam War on American history. Their ceremonies at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial are helped carry out its mission to honor those who have served and sacrificed for our country. As they say in the service, carry on, VVMS. Your accomplishments are both admired and appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time today. God bless our fallen and their families. God bless our men in uniform. And God bless the greatest nation on earth. Thank you. Staff Sergeant Rich Custer. Our next speaker is one of the many women who have served in Vietnam. She served in the 95th EVAC Hospital in Da Nang, where she worked in the intensive care and recovery unit. She continued to serve for 25 years. Please welcome Lieutenant Colonel Retired Mary Louderback. started in 1969 when I was a junior in nursing school and a good friend of mine found out about a, an army program that called the buddy system so the two of us went down to Cherry Street in Philadelphia and became PFCs the army paid our last year of school and then we owed two years after basic training at Fort Sam Houston I my first assignment was at Fort McClellan Alabama and a good friend of mine who from basic training was in Vietnam. And she wrote me a letter and said, you have to come over. I was like, okay. So in October of 1971, I made my way from Philadelphia to Oakland and eventually got to the 95th of Ac in Da Nang. It was a 400 bed hospital and we had every specialty, neuro, a lot of ortho, surgical, and after a year, I came home. I, we saw a lot of, um, you know, horrible injuries and different, it, it was just an interesting uh, time for me. But I never felt like afraid. The biggest thing I worried about when I was over there was my hair was gonna curl too much because it was humid. Well, anyway, after I got back, I decided since I had the GI Bill, I would go to Villanova for my degree. And it just so happens that the gal who interviewed me for school was in a reserve unit. She was a World War II nurse. And she said to me, you have to get in the reserves. So I thought, oh, she looks like fun. So I decided to get in the reserve unit and I retired from the reserves in 1993 as a Lieutenant Colonel. And um, we went all up and down the East Coast with the reserve unit. It was, it was really, uh, you know, she gave me a lot of good advice to get in the unit. And um, I now am retired from my civilian job and I'm in a, a military organization of world wars. And I, you know, we get together with the ROTC and do a lot of things for the children in the, in the uh, high school programs. And, um, you know, but I always felt like Vietnam gave me a lot of self-confidence in myself. And, and just felt lucky that I wasn't where a lot of the men were. So, anyway, that's that's my uh, um, that's my story, and it was a, it was a it was a good experience for me. So, and I just want to thank the uh, the veterans for giving me the honor to come and speak today. It's it's uh, it's been just a special time for me, and that's all I have. Thank you, Lieutenant Kirby. I'd like to begin the end of the program by reading a list of 22 names who were local to Upper Providence Township in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, who paid the ultimate sacrifice and names are on the wall. Walter Joseph Jankowski, Richard Willis Minnick Jr., Robert Lee Vaughn, Douglas Isaac Moyer, Robert E. Ash, Lawrence R. Detweiler, Jr. Rudolph Francis Dungeon.
Thomas Joseph Hartman, James Anthony Kelly Jr., John Arne Polefko, Thomas Joseph Bontour, Lawrence Edward Bach, Richard Edwin Powell, Leslie James Stewart, Gerald Lester Hartzell, Roy Allen Gebhard, Emerson E. Heller, Earl W. Himes, Robert Lee Shaw, Charles Horton Eubank, Robert Childress, David Brox Lefebvre. I'd also like to recognize all of the committee members who are vital to bringing the wall that heals to Upper Providence Township. Don Kelly, Dan Schaefer, Linda Rooney, Mark Freeman, Robert Solorio, Elizabeth Daly, John Pearson, Gail Latch, Patty Fiore, Ken Campbell, Robert Gilly Gillinger, Mike Rissell, Red Hill and Trap VFW, Valley Forge Military Academy, and Valley Forge Baptist Temple, the Upper Providence Township Board of Supervisors, and last but not least, the main binder that put this all together for us, Sue Hoffman. We thank you to all the committee members. Please welcome back from Valley Forge Baptist Temple for a benediction, Pastor Sam Aylstock. Let's everybody stand for a closing word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are supremely grateful for the special occasion for which we are gathered today. Thank you, Lord, for each military person and civil servant who loves America and who seeks to make it a better place. And we are especially grateful for the brave Americans who were killed in the line of duty to preserve our freedoms. As we depart from this place today, may this wall serve as a catalyst to strengthen our resolve, to labor for the cause of freedom, and to keep America the greatest nation on earth. As we need your wisdom and guidance, may we be quick to show Christian love and gratitude to those who fought and fight for freedom's sake. Dismiss us with your blessing. We humbly pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. This concludes our ceremony from the East Knoll. I'd like to invite everyone over to the wall while we have a brief wreath laying ceremony with our three Vietnam veterans. They will also be joined by the Washington DC Daughters of the American Revolution. After the wreath has been laid, taps will be performed by Gunnery Sergeant Anthony Bellino of the President's own United States Marine Corps Band. Thank you everybody for coming out. This concludes our ceremony here.